from Wild Food UK and welcome to another Wild Food UK video. Um, this one was all shot on the uh, 22nd of January, the day after our uh, Wild Food UK staff Christmas party. So I actually managed to drag a lot of our instructors. I, I say drag, they're all very keen foragers. I went out with a lot of our instructors on this day. So I've, uh, I've taken the opportunity to introduce you guys to uh, some of our other instructors around the country whilst um, they introduce you to the lovely things that we were finding in January. The video has got some greens in it as well as some really interesting mushrooms. But just bear in mind, we were all up very late and we had a very good uh, party. So some of us look a little bit bleary eyed. I can assure you though that no COVID regulations were broken. Um, hope you enjoy the video. Right, so I'm always getting asked by you guys to do more plant videos. Um, as you know, if you've subscribed to the channel, uh, most of my videos are on mushrooms. We go foraging for plants as well, all year round. And uh, I've been asked recently to do some winter greens videos. And that's what you're gonna get right now. Cause just down here, we've got a little salad board. And I've got Dr. Rob, who's one of Hello. our instructors, uh, who's gonna tell you about two or three different plants that you find Pretty much the whole year, I'd say, most of these, Rob. Um, but they are always around in winter too. So there's certainly ones that go into our salads in winter. So take it away, Mr. Judson. Cool. Yeah, come on in and I'll, um, I'll sort of point out what's what. Any sort of patch of grassland, you're not just gonna have grass, you're gonna have a whole host of different plants. And it's good to just have a look, pay attention and sort of see what's there. So uh, perhaps if we focus in a little bit, uh, we could see uh, this is a nice little patch here, perhaps. So you can see here, these are the typical sort of oval leaves of, of a common daisy, Bellis perennis, which is an edible plant. And uh, it's not super tasty, but it's worth knowing. And um, you can slip some of those leaves into your salad. Kind of near it, you've got these sort of more triangular, pointy, almost like sycamore type leaf shape of a, a buttercup, creeping buttercup. So that one is poisonous, ranunculus, and uh, you don't want to eat that. Um, more interesting than that, perhaps, you've got some other stuff. So you've got here a nice, slightly nibbled uh, common sorrel leaf. You can see with the classic little pointy tips that point backwards. You got there. So that's a common sorrel leaf. I always look at the back of it as well to make sure it's not lords and ladies. You see the little offshooting veins with that rather than a kind of crazy paving effect that you'd see with lords and ladies and you really, really don't want to eat that one. Over here, you've got one of the um, the plantains. So this is ribwort plantain, still at a, quite a young stage. All the plantains have these sort of veins that start at the, the base of the leaf and go to the tip. They sort of fan out slightly and then they come in again at the tip. This one could be hoary plantain, but it's not got, not got the hairs of it. So we know it's just a young ribwort plantain. And then probably the reason that we um, brought you to this patch is because we wanted to discuss uh, a lovely, delicious edible plant. So there's one little leaf there, it's growing there. And I've uh, picked a slightly bigger one here just to sort of illustrate the features a little bit better. Oh, I lost my tip of it there, let's find another one. There you go. Bit of grass. So this here is, uh, one of the cardamines, so in that sort of bittercress family. But it's got quite a glossy sheen to it, this one. And this is actually cardamine pretensis, which is lady smock or the cuckoo flower. And this kind of glossy sheen is, uh, is one of the really helpful I identifying features in kind of telling this apart from some of the other uh, bittercresses like hairy bittercress or wavy bittercress. And there's a few of them. So that look for that glossy sheen to it. The other thing is, they often form rosettes, but the, the rosette of a hairy bittercress is a, it's a far more sort of clustered array of little leaf stems. So I've, I picked one of those just over there, just to show you. You can see here, you've got a really kind of neat and dense cluster forming that rosette. Whereas you can't even really clearly see that there are rosettes of the lady smock when you look here at this. There's often just sort of two or three little, um, little stems with the leaves on it. So 
but the combination of those features so you've got the the shiny glossy nature of the uh of the ladies smock compare that with the the sort of more sort of bland or matte finish of the uh of the um hairy bittercress and then the fact that it's not forming such a dense clustered rosette really key features the other one that can also be useful is often the sort of spade like final leaf on the um uh lady smock is often a lot bigger and dramatically so than the um uh, the little the rest of the little leaflets so that's a helpful feature too sometimes and then all of them are edible so it's not a problem but you uh, want to have a little nibble and you get a kind of delicious sort of rush of kind of wasabi like heat so we often call this wasabi cress because it is it is really deliciously hot you know that's one tiny little leaf and i can feel that sort of tasty burn in my mouth all the cresses you know there's a sort of slightly spicy cress like flavor but far more so with the uh, the lady smock and you uh in summer and spring when it's flowering it's so easy to tell apart it's got these beautiful white sort of slightly pinky um flowers and you can kind of clock that you know it's going to be growing there all year round. So here we are in January, in the dead of winter, and uh, we've got these this beautiful, fresh, spicy salad to come and pick. So kind of clock the spots and, uh, and know where to come and pick it. And when it is in flower, the flowers themselves are delicious. They've got that heat and the basil leaves, but actually the, the other little leaves on the stem actually often lack that, that kind of spicy flavor and are not, not so tasty to eat. So the basil leaves and the flowers are really what you're after. But the whole cardamine family is great, but I think probably Lady Smock is the is the tastiest of the lot. So go out and find it. Hey, we've got Gwen and Phil here. Phil's uh, one of our instructors from uh, the North Midlands, and uh, this is his lovely daughter Gwen, who's going to do a little taste test for us on another lovely winter green. So. Phil, do you want to tell us about the green we're in uh, in the presence of? Very unusually here, we've got some ferns, not worried about the ferns, however, we've got a very distinctive plant here, it's navelwort. Very unusual, they look like a flat slice of cucumber almost, but with a sort of depression in the middle. Very, very distinctive. You're not going to mix them up with anything else. And they're a lovely, tasty winter green. They grow on rock. Now this is a wall, but it's a rock wall. So this is the sort of place they like to grow. So Gwen, can you have a little munch on that? Tell us what you think of it. I'll have a little munch too. Do you like that Gwen? Mm. It's juicy, mm. very juicy. I tasted one of them. Yeah. So a lovely winter green, very distinctive. You're not gonna mistake it for anything else. Grows on rock. Looks like a sliced cucumber with a dimple in the middle. Navel word. Umbilicus rupestris, because it looks like a navel. And uh, I think Gwen's enjoying it. I certainly do. I will say one thing, though, about your uh, penny port or navel port. Um, it's always worth having a little taste test first. I don't know why, but at certain times a year, it has an awful bitterness to it. But right now, in the middle of January, this is tasting lovely and juicy and it adds a nice almost cucumber crunch as Phil said to your salad so yeah should we pick a bit more of this good good <laughs> So guys, this is our uh, amazing Fabiolus, and uh, much like me, he's uh, very much a fungi lover. So he refused to do a video on uh, plants for you today. Uh, instead, he's found a lovely winter edible mushroom to show you. So uh, it's one I've not done a video on before. So take it away, Fabio. Hello everyone, my name is Fabio. I do the foraging courses for Wild Food UK in the southeast of the country. So if you've been to one of the courses down there, you probably met me. If not, hello everyone. Uh, and what I got here is a lovely mushroom that I often find uh, throughout the winter and spring at times when we don't find many other mushrooms. And it's this mushroom called the Sordid Bluet. Okay, so most foragers are familiar with the two main species of bluets, the 
wood blew it and the uh, field blew it. But there's this other species with purple colors called the sordid blue it. And as you can see, if we just have here a plan, uh, look at the size. This is a very small mushroom compared with wood blue its and field blue its. Like literally a miniature version of the wood blue it growing on the soil, usually soil with a lot of debris. So we see here all these uh, clippings and fallen needles. Um, on the uh, ground, on the soil. And this is the type of habitat that it prefers, often growing in gardens and, and parks, sometimes in open woodland as well. So I'm gonna pull the mushroom. And what we can see on the underside is these vibrant purple colors, just like we would see with a wood bluet. Okay, pretty much all the key identifiers you, you have from a wood bluet apply here. So. Purple lilac gills, very crowded, and the purple stem as well. A slightly perfumed smell. It's not as intense as the wood blew it, but if you have a good nose, you might be able to pick it up as well. Then on the cap, I find that quite often we have this little bump in the center of the cap, what mycologists would call uh, a numbo. Okay, so you often have this. Uh, on the center of the cap and I already broke the stem but we have here the bases of the stem of these mushrooms and just like with wood bluets when you pull them all of these debris come attached to the base of the stem okay? the mycelium is binding all the debris on the soil so that will help you identify the mushroom as well there isn't a lot that you could confuse uh the entolomas the pink gills uh can look some of them can look a bit similar but they will have pink gills not lilac uh purple earlier in the year when you're walking around mycorrhizal trees like the the oak and the beech and the spruce um you may be able to find mushrooms like the amethyst deceiver with strong purple colors they have more of a rubber uh, texture to them and widely spaced gills. Then you have the lilac fiber cap, which is toxic, which is a smaller mushroom, smaller than this. And the gills would be white, a lot paler than these ones. Okay. And on the top of the cap, on the lilac fiber caps, there are fibers that go along the cap. Okay. But at this time of the year, it's now January, end of January, we're deep into the winter and throughout light winter and spring. I think I found these mushrooms uh, pretty much every month of the year, to be honest, but I often see them to April, May, June. So at times when we're not really finding many other mushrooms, this is a lovely one. Um, to be able to recognize and add on to your meal. It's very tasty, like the wood blew it. Um, and I think it goes very well, for example, with noodles, noodle soups. The purple gills really stand out, right? Does so it have uh, the same sort of smell as the wood blue it? Uh, very similar, but it's a lot fainter than the wood blue it. So the wood blue it does have a strong perfume smell. I find that the sordid blue it has a much weaker faint smell. Okay, so if you have a very good nose, you might be able to pick it for the most part. I can hardly smell anything on this one. Okay, so I go mostly for, but from, um, by looking at the other features. Okay. Excellent. Uh, what have you got there, Phil? Oh, I think I've got one of the vetches. Oh, okay. Tell us a bit about that then. So vetches is something we forage for in the spring and summer. Lovely, lovely plants. Always want the purple ones uh, and make sure they haven't got long hairs on them and make sure they haven't got the flowers on a crown or like on a stick. But we tell our vetches from our vetchlings by the fact they've got little tendrils on them. Here we can see because they're one of the pea family. So they have little tendrils that reach out and grasp the other plants. But at this time of the year, because we haven't got any flowers, we can't tell which ones they are and some of them are poisonous. So then we have to wait till we can see the flowers and we wait till we see the fully grown plants. Can have a wee look at that? There you go. You're getting some close-ups there, Gwen. 
Yeah. This this is what you want to photo, these little climbing tendrils. As your dad says, they identify that as vetch. Now, you did mention we only eat the, the purple flowered ones. Um, there's a, a good reason for that, everyone. There are some highly toxic vetches in the UK. So like Phil said, only eat the ones with purple flowers. And if you can't see any flowers, don't eat your vetch. But if you do get those purple flowers, I think Phil would agree, they're almost like eating peas from the pod, those lovely purple flowers. Oh. They're a, a lovely garnish for your salads and they add a great flavour as well as looking lovely. So remember your vetches, only go for the ones with purple flowers. And uh, yeah, we won't feed any of this to Gwen. We're not sure. No. <laughs> right, let's see what else there is around here. Hi, I'm Eric from Wild Food UK and this is, well, getting towards the end of January now and I found something I really didn't think we would. If you want to pan down, not a very good example, but considering the time of year, this is a Trompmort, Trompe de Mort, or Craterellus cornucopoides. And in my hand, I've got a slightly better one here. I've already actually done a video about these, so really, I just wanted to do a quick update because I've never found them in January before. And these aren't the best examples, but you can see they're very hard to spot. They just look like leaf litter on the ground. So you have to be really careful. If you spot one, check where you're walking. Uh, because you might be standing on them. But yeah, for this time of year, fantastic little find. Right, okay, so continuing with the winter greens, uh, we've found, uh, what is, to me, it's a little bit surprising to find this at this time of year. I don't know about you, Kerry, but... Um, quite mild. It has, yeah, we've had a very mild winter so far, um, but you are pretty much our plant expert, so tell us what you see down there. Right, so what we have here is one of the watercresses. Now, um, with that, you've got two options. One is in the carrot family and one is in the cress family. How do you tell them apart? Well, the leaves look slightly different, um, but the best tool that you've really got with some of these things is your nose. Now, the one that's in the carrot family, Fool's watercress, will smell like carrots, whereas the true watercress in the carrot in the cress family will smell like cress, like your egg and cress sandwiches. So what we want to do is we want to pick a bit. And uh, this is something that you would want to cook rather than eat raw just because of the possibility of liver fluke. So we give it a sniff, a crush and a sniff. And here we've got that lovely fresh carrot smell. And uh, obviously you can't smell that through the camera. No, we don't have smell of vision yet. No, we're working on it. Um, but if you do find one and you want to tell the difference, um, they have different flowers. Uh, so if you get it at the right time, you can you can have a look at the different flowers there. But really uh, what we need to do is utilize our nose for telling the difference here. And it's one of those ones that make a nice soup. It's got a nice fresh, strong carroty flavor and uh, again as i mentioned we have a potential for liver fluke here so we don't want to be harvesting out of streams um, and eating the leaves raw we want to be cooking that ideally yeah you basically don't eat things from uh, straight from streams even things like hairy bittercress if they're growing beside a stream then there is a chance of liver flukes which are a nasty nasty parasite to get uh, there's one other warning with this plant though it's growing beside water and um, although you don't really get much of it at this time of year you do always have to worry about hemlock water dropwort which is reasonably similar to this plant doesn't really have a carroty smell. It is in the carrot family though, that plant. So it has uh, more of a carroty smell than um, the normal watercress. Uh, so if you are gonna go picking your fool's watercress, which is perfectly edible, and I use it in my soup bases, like Kerry said, um, then make sure you're familiar with hemlock water dropwort as well. We've also got another plant here, just um, down there, you've got some brook lime. So, what do we know about brook lime? So brook lime uh, 
in the past used to share, I think, some of the, uh, one of the common names with Fool's Watercress. It's actually in the Speedwell family though. And in the spring, you'll see clouds of delicate little blue flowers coming out of this. And so if you see this, uh, you know that there's water nearby, even if you can't actually see the water, it will always be in wet ground. And it's a little bit bitter, but we need a bit more bitterness in our diet. It's no more bitter really than a lettuce that you'd buy in the shops. And again, you get masses of it uh, during the winter. So there's no need to put your bra on and go down to the co-op to get your, your salad veg that's been imported from Morocco. Uh, you can just go to your nearest boggy patch in your garden if you're lucky to have that. And um, yeah, uh, so again, that would go into your salads or your salsa verdes or as a soup base, something, something nice and green. Turn around here. There's a pig eating my jacket. I'm just going to go and save it. <laughs> Porky, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I've got to say, I don't eat brook lime. I don't think it's a particularly tasty green, um, but it is certainly one that you can pick in winter. So uh, another nice winter green for you. Thank you very much, Kerry. I don't know where the bra comment came from, though. I don't go to the shops. Just um, another lovely, lovely find for the day. We've uh, we've got some nice fresh, fresh-ish winter chanterelles. So not bad for the 22nd of January. Trompe de Mort and winter chanterelles. It has been quite mild, so their season is lasting, which makes me and Eric happy foragers. Let's find some more. filming already yeah okay all right well uh, we've just found something really really interesting and i'm gonna hand over to attila here attila fodi our resident wild food uk mycologist and fabio our other big myco uh mycophile i suppose you you are almost yeah. mycologically trained but it's kind of almost self-taught with you either way these yeah. are our two real mushroom pros and uh they're going to tell us about or tell you guys about this really interesting mushroom here so attila what is this mushroom this mushroom is called cinnamon bracket uh you don't need too wide imagination to find out what is named after cinnamon if you see the color from the top from underneath if you make a cross section so cut it half everywhere this mushroom is really a cinnamon colored something yeah. You can see it's really spongy, uh, it's dried, but uh, when, it's, when it's not that dry, it is spongy and soft. Uh, when it's dried, it became some sort of uh, strange... Uh, what is the good word for that? Uh, like... Uh, plasterine? Like plasticine. Uh, plasticine. Like Play-Doh. Yeah, Play-Doh. Like, uh, some malleable. dried Play-Doh. You can... You can... Yeah manipulate the, the shape of the fungus and then bend it and shape it a yeah. little bit. So it has this kind of texture. Uh, it's really important to know that this is the only toxic polypore mushroom all over the Europe in, and including the UK as well. And it has a really interesting feature. So because it's really high uh, in uh, polyporic acid content, it's able to turn your urine purple. And this is one of the diagnostic method. Uh, it's sometimes picked by mistake uh, because people believe it's a beefsteak fungus, a little bit dry, a little bit old beefsteak fungus. Color-wise might be something quite similar-ish if you are not mycologically trained. And it was uh, documented in France that they had a poisoning case because a father took it home, cooked it for the family. And yeah, they had some really hard and heavy kidney issues. So yeah. once you, you have a purplish V 
call your doctor, go to the NHS and try to save your life. <laughs> right, okay. So it's a, it's a polypore and yeah, it is reasonably soft and malleable. Obviously, the two polypores that we eat, that we go foraging for, that could uh, potentially be mistaken for this by a complete novice, you'd have to be pretty silly, uh, the chicken of the woods, uh, Lytoporus sulfureus, and our beefsteak fungus, Fistulina hepatica. Um, this is a mushroom that uh, will really attack your liver, so don't don't feed it to someone just to turn their wee purple for a uh, kidneys, not liver, uh, to turn their wee purple for a joke. It would not have a happy ending. Anyway, the cinnamon bracket. What's its uh, scientific name? Hapilopilus? Rutilans. Ha Rutilans. Yeah, I think it used to be Nidolans before. Mm. It's one of them that changed name. Yeah, they yeah. were used as synonyms, but uh, the latest uh, polypore related uh, publication used uh, Rutilans, so I'm stick with that. Okay. Well, if you stick with cinnamon bracket, you can't go wrong. No, <laughs> no, the common names stay the same. That's, uh, that's what we like. Anyway, great find, great spot. And uh, I'm really pleased that we've got to show you this mushroom because if you are foraging for your chicken of the woods and your beefsteak fungus, this is one you should know about. It's um, probably grown on birch here, you think, Attila, is what you said? Yes, I would Looks say like that uh, because uh, the close uh, trees are birch, so it's very likely a birch. Will it grow on other types of tree? Yes, I mostly found it on, on uh, oak. Right. And sometimes on uh, black locust or robinia or acacia. I don't know which one is the UK name of robinia or pseudo acacia. Okay. So yeah. if it grows on oak, then it could be mistaken for the beefsteak fungus because beefsteak fungus is exclusive to oak and chestnut. Um, you won't find beefsteak fungus growing on a birch tree. Um, so there we go. The yep. cinnamon bracket. Yeah, great to find this poisonous bracket, the first for us. Yes, yeah. uh, I know we found some lovely edible mushrooms today, but you two look more pleased with this than of you course. are with the trompe de mort. I am, yeah, because I am. I've seen trompe de mort before and I've never seen <laughs> the infamous poisonous polypore. I've been looking at this in books for ages and dreaming about the day that I would find <laughs> it. I even, I even asked Attila, have you seen it down south? I will travel there to go see it. So I'm really pleased to finally see it. Me and, too, I'm and just pleased one, with this. One bit a bit of information which might be useful if you are a fan of natural dyeing uh, wool or silk or whatever it is used as a dyeing agent because if you add some uh, uh, potassium hydroxide or any other alkaline it really turns uh, purplish pink to purplish so it it gives uh, this kind of color to the wool well that's interesting yep. very interesting there you go we are proper mushroom nerds <laughs> Let's go and find some edibles though, shall we? Yeah, yeah let's sure. do that. But I'm going to take this one. So there you go. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed our, our little video and uh, you enjoyed uh, learning things from all of my other excellent instructors. Um, do remember a few things though, don't eat things from streams, even that brook lime that Kerry and me were talking about uh, isn't something you should eat raw from a stream just because of the, the risk of liver flukes. And one last thing I want to say about that mushroom that had us all turning into gooey mushroom nerds is uh, if you really want to tell the difference between the cinnamon bracket and the beefsteak fungus cut it in half the beefsteak fungus is the one that bleeds the cinnamon bracket won't anyway uh, if you did enjoy the video please give it a like and uh, i'll be publishing another one as soon as i can happy foraging <laughs>